I think in my birth there was a computer mistake. I should have something wrong programming. I should have landed here rather than there. And it took me 20 years to get back home here. India had been in my upbringing and in my life. I, I feel fortunate. I feel privileged. To be in India, to be a foreigner in India, that's been, that's been able and has been allowed to make it my home. When my husband died, in 1976, and, and people asked me, are you going back to England? <laughs> I was quite amazed that anybody should even suggest it, because India was my home, and India is my home, and I just love it. I miss, I miss the noises and the smells. Everything's very acute here, and, and once you get sort of hooked on that, it's, it's, uh, it's really hard to, to enjoy other places. My foreignness, in one way, people are more attracted to, for example, a man who is a para from Europe or a, or a commander from Europe. Or... Sometimes in a village, you know, people would say Angres, Angres. But it's not said in an in a unpleasant manner. It's just said to show the, that, you know, your difference. Which uh, actually uh, was more felt by the people than by myself. I felt very much uh, part of it all from the, from the beginning. I have now spent, if I take my childhood, 40 out of the 60 odd years I've lived in this country. So it's probably the natural place for me to be, really. What is it about India that inspires so many to discover it? To try and understand it? It seems to possess that elusive quality of a long ago legend, which in turn possesses countless others to sift through its very many nuances. Explore the myth and the vision, only to discover that it is real, present, and also pervasive. Probably because somewhere along the way, the myth and the vision give way and become a geographic and economic entity. The bundle of contradictions unfold from a paradox into a cultural unity amidst diversity. A multi-layered, many-textured reality. Enriched over time by explorers and travelers, traders and even plunderers. Armies accumulating wealth and territory for their king. People seeking refuge from religious persecution. Wise men in search of knowledge and wisdom. Students, holy men preaching to convert. Finally, by an imperial power to become a jewel in its crown. A process so self-perpetuating that each initiating yet more to come. To discover, to understand, and then to make it their own. India is a very good training for becoming wider than just one's own nation. There is an aspect of um, beyond nationality in India. There is something which is um, from the soul quality, from the inner quality. There is something which I have not encountered anywhere. If you walk around New York, you see all nations represented there. It's also something of, you know, uh, international ambience. But this is a kind of um, external internationalism. India has uh, an inner universal or international strength and power to which people are attracted. They feel it is not cancelling their own nationality, but widening it. No? I don't think that in India one ever feels uh, this ostracized if you're a foreigner. I think um, Indian, Indians are largely 
uh, used to, uh, to see people uh, from all walks of life. And the whole history of India has been a succession of foreigners coming and settling down in this country. So I think it's very much um, in, in the mind of the, in the Indian psyche that, uh, you know, to be open to, to, to foreign, uh, uh, you know, influences and foreign uh, look at life, etc. India is uh, like a salad, uh, whereas America is like a melting pot. And what is the difference between those two? A melting pot, everyone gets put into it, boiled up together, and a sort of sludge emerges out of it. A salad, everyone is there side by side, your tomato, your cucumber, your lettuce, your uh, whatever else it is. But they all remain a cucumber, a tomato, a lettuce. You don't boil it all up and make this sludge. This confluence of influences and an inherent ability to nourish whatever is sown into its soil, along with the freedom to attain its full potential, is what India has been associated with through the millennia and even today. I feel that um, it's the diversity and the richness of India's tradition as well as modernity that is what's so exciting about it. I mean, it's often said that we live in many centuries at the same time, even millennia. And that is one of the greatest things about India. That's something that I love and that I miss tremendously when I'm away from this country. Not only our civilization is wonderful, I mean, it's such an old, it's probably the oldest living civilization today. Our spirituality is the oldest living spirituality today. Uh, our medicine, medical system, you know, the, uh, it's the oldest medical system still practiced today, you know. Our breathing techniques, the pranayama, the oldest, you know, there's nothing else left in the world. I mean, all the great civilizations have come, they have gone, you know. They had knowledge, they had, you know, techniques, but it's all gone, you know, it's all, you know, in, the, in history. A land where things come together in a very remarkable way. I mean, one of the things which fascinates me most about India is the religions of India and the way that uh, they have this history of living together in a way which is quite remarkable when you think of the religious wars and strifes that there have been in the West and indeed in other parts of the world. Again, India is a land where people of different ethnic origins come together and somehow live together. India is a land where people speaking many different languages live together without feeling the need necessarily to change those languages or anything like that. So I think India is a land of great variety which somehow or other holds together. However, it is this very diversity in form and spirit, compounded with an inability to fathom it, that gives birth to misconceptions about India outside of it. What follows is not just a selective perception, but even more selective portrayal, encouraging more ambiguity and myths. I, th I think... Uh... The problem is that foreigners have very uh, stereotype uh, images about India. You know, they've heard of, of India. Those who have not visited India, of course, when, once they've come, 
uh, they realize that it's very, very different from the image that is for some reason projected uh, in the West or outside India, by the, largely by the press, actually. When you come to India, you don't I mean, you come with all these cliches and pre yourself, you know, are part of that prejudice. So, so because I've lived in India a long term, because I'm married to an Indian, because I've traveled all over this country, you know, and I feel an empathy for the people, I've, you know, I, I start thinking like them and seeing in their way. Then I realize how, what a negative image India has abroad and how much she suffers, and how much India suffers from that negative image. Even economically, I mean, people are not investing in India, the Western nation, because of that negative image of India. I have been criticized sometimes for my reporting on India, and certainly the BBC, which I used to work for, was often criticized when I worked for it. Um, and I have written books, which have not been by any means uh, wholly uncritical of India. Because th your editors ask for all these negative things. You know, basically, they're interested you know, in negative, output from India. So they, there's a lot of pressure on you, you know, to do, whether it's politically, you know, whether it's to, to report on catastrophes, to report on corruption, to report. So it's very difficult for a journalist to work in India. Either, you know, he bans, you know, and he follows the trend, which is, you know, report negatively, you know, find the negative angle, find the sensationalist angle, or if he tries to put across something more truthful, more real, it's very difficult. India actually undersells itself. India is always going on about how people give it a bad image and that sort of thing. India should not care about that. India should worry about progressing on the same lines and India should be proud of what it's achieved but should also look honestly at its failures and try and do something about those failures. <laughs> In 50 years, what India has been able to achieve in the form of uh, agriculture, we've been able to feed uh, 950 million people, which is not an easy task with our agricultural revolutions. In industry, we are about, I think, the ninth or tenth industrial nation in the world, another great achievement. Then the question of computer science and technology, information technology, our network of communication throughout the country has been remarkable. I always say that it's a country on the move. Uh, it's a country that is opening up. It's a country that's liberalizing. We waited a little long, but it has uh, happened. And I think it's uh, now India is, is really on the right, uh, on the, in the global market, on the right uh, track. In these 25, 30 years, the world has become a small place. So we've all integrated. You know, there's more of the West in India. There's more of India in the West. There's so much more interaction with the entire world on all levels, whether it's business or craft or tourism or education. There's so much more traveling. There are people from outside here, people from here outside. I think that that's the biggest change in my experience. You know, so we've moved from a very traditional culture to a complete sort of mishmash of everything that's going on from the high tech to the traditional. And then, you know, maybe this is a period in which India will find its own way of, 
of being itself in a, in a modern world. I think you have achieved this in a great measure because you have stuck to the democratic way rather than trying what might appear to be the fast path of some form of totalitarianism. <laughs> During my 30 years, the, the leaps and bounds in terms of economic upliftment and industrial and commercial progress um, is fairly incredible. I mean, sometimes to a, a frustrating degree because, you know, in terms of my own history, it's a lot of what has developed is, is, a, is a lot of what I was running away from, in a sense, from in terms of Western consumerist, materialistic, money-minded society. It's certainly caught up with us. But then where in the world hasn't it caught up, you know? We don't need all the excesses of the West in India. And I think India so far has been able to keep a fairly good uh, balance between um, opening its doors and at the same time uh, preventing things which are not wanted in India, things that have flopped elsewhere. I don't buy the idea of total liberalization. And I certainly don't I buy the idea that the market should be the sole arbiter of what happens. It seems to me that in a country where you still have so many poor people, the government must have some control over the economy, some control over resources. But the key to that is to exercise that control efficiently and effectively, and to choose very specifically the limited areas where you feel you need to exercise that control. A perfect example of why, certainly in, in my subject, which is environmental um, issues, we don't need um, um, pressures or, or large funds from the outside world, is um, the, the, the World Bank thing, which is, which is, it's outrageous. They are pouring money into unsuitable projects, and it's only a loan. So, I mean, we're going to bankrupt ourselves, paying back um, an organization for ruining a perfectly workable system, which, which will no longer be workable. India has certainly evolved. Uh, India's economy has grown. India has modernized to quite a considerable extent. Uh, things have changed. Um, I personally feel that uh, more change is required and I hope that more change will come in. But at the same time, I would hate to see India change to such an extent that it became like a Western country or like America or some country like that. I have nothing against America or Western countries, but uh, I like India because it's Indian. While each country is what it is, quite obviously, the experience of India encourages a plurality of thought and deed. Which allows individuals onto journeys of their very own. Without the rigidities of conformity to be and to become.
I love the, um, the opportunity to be rhythmically challenged, uh, to have all of the expression in the dance, to have the beautiful movements. It uses the, the body differently, of course, than Western dance. You're grounded. Um, the personal space is more important than the architectural space. But the depth of the emotional content, the depth of the um, metaphysical content, is what has kept me going as an Indian classical dancer over the years. Not getting locked into simply um, a beautiful technique. Not because it's pretty, but because it's sublime. And it offers me an opportunity to choreograph, to create, to be innovative, and yet to use a vocabulary that has been developed over centuries. I mean, there's so many rewarding things. I mean, the, the Turtle Project was hugely rewarding, um, personally. And I spent two and a half years making a film on tigers for, for National Geographic. And that... Um, it was was because it was a very intimate story on on tigers wild tigers there were no people in it um, that went down very very well here as well as being tiger on that side too but um, and there are funny things like I was walking in in the Howrah station not long ago in in Calcutta and I heard this very familiar noise and I looked up on the screen and um, and in the middle of the station, they were showing this film that I'd made. And there was a huge crowd of people and, and coolies and, and passengers and things and all watching this film on tigers. And that gave me a, a huge kick. I mean, I thought, I thought you know, this is really what it's all about. I came and I saw that there was this tremendous wealth of tradition and skill. I mean, just unbelievable. And it still is, you know, and it's still there. And there was this world outside that had never been, you know, had the opportunity to see any of it, really. My work, like with Anoki, and over the years, it's provided the most fantastic opportunities to work with wonderful people, um, people who, you know, are sincere in their efforts to work and to raise life and to give of their best. And that's been fantastic. And the whole Enoki experience, which, as I've explained to you, I'm now moved out of that. Um, but we've had the opportunity to create together um, an organization which feels now after 25, 30 years, you know, a secure organization where people can come and can work together and can work in a sort of dignified and secure context, whether they're artists, craftspeople, uneducated people who we can bring in, unskilled people who we can bring in and they can help with the systems in the, in the organization. What has given me the tremendous amount of satisfaction has been my work in education and the school which I founded, Springdales. You know, I have thousands of old Springdalians all over the world and the love, the respect, the regard they give me as their old teacher is something so heartwarming. And I don't think uh, other countries, the pupils of other countries would give that in so much abundance of love and affection as uh, our Indian students give to their teachers. As the children came and I went through the experience of raising children in India, I more and more valued the, the family culture of India, which I think is more and more rare in our developing and materialistic world. And I think that it's a fantastic asset that this country has, that you know the family ties and the family values are so strong, and children are so valued, and people reach out to them you know, in every walk of life, in every situation. And I realized that that was a privilege to be raising children in that country, in such a culture.
I'm, I'm, I'm a single parent, I'm not married, and yet took on the responsibility. Actually not perhaps even realizing how long it would last. Um, but it's become a, you know, a lifelong, lifelong relationship. And uh, that street urchin is now, well, he's just done uh, his third year exams uh, in history honors. And he's, um, he's doing computers, and he's actually just done a camera course also. As I look into the camera, I will be reminded of that. Um, so that, that's, um, I mean, how close uh, can, you, uh, can you get? I guess perhaps I could have married, but then I'm not the marrying kind, I realized. I, you know. Each one of us brings an essential ingredient to the, to the total. And um, maybe by discovering my Germanness or my foreignness um, helps to evolve, let's say, a culture here where I can then be more close and more at home with the Indianness around me. What I'm saying is if you can become your own fully, then you meet somewhere deeper. Only a country which has a certain dignity as a nation possesses a core which is immutable. But forms which are ever-changing can be a cradle for a civilization which though is the oldest in the world, yet is also a pulsating reality today. Forever experimenting and continuously evolving, but at the same time nourishing the core. India has great spirituality. You know? It's not even you can't say you know it's a you know it's a set spirituality or it's a, you know, it's just the way people are you know the way they are you know their tolerance you know their their innate you know aspiration you know for something beyond you know something very simple very basic you know forget about mysticism. Whatever my lifestyle changes or anything, it doesn't change the character. It should not change the character. For example, a human being is a person who has certain human values. That's why, for example, we don't make difference between people here. A man who has kindness, generosity, compassion, he's a human being. If we have a modern lifestyle, should we lose it? We should not lose that. If we introduce in modern society the good qualities, there's nothing wrong in it. But don't throw away the qualities for some material benefit. But I think more and more the West is recognizing that some deeper values are missing. I think they know that, and that's uh, increasingly they're turning to values which are kept still alive in India. Sri Aurobindo calls India the guardian of the spirit, or the guru of the world. Um, if you, I, I, I believe it's true. But a guru is called the dispeller of darkness. He removes darkness. He doesn't teach. For example, if I teach people, people become dependent upon me. I want to make independent, so they can solve their own problems, so they can live for themselves. They should not be slaves of anybody. But then maybe, just maybe, the idea that is India lives on unsubdued, unconquered, perhaps even undiscovered, inspiring, inviting yet more to come and to discover, to understand and then to call her their own, for ultimately home is where the heart is.